we've gone to all this trouble of defining all these rules about reference frames, and it seems kind of a shame to waste all this machinery if we're only ever going to be using a single reference frame. But remember, reference frames are the bases of vector spaces, specifically of the Euclidean vector space, and basis sets are not unique, which means that reference frames are not unique. I should be able to describe the R3 space in an infinite number of ways, meaning I can define an infinite number of reference frames. For now, we will postulate that this is a useful thing. And as we go along, we will demonstrate to ourselves that this is a useful thing. But now we have the problem of how do we convert between the representation of a vector between two different frames. And the machinery for that is given to us by things called direction cosine matrices. And in our notation, um, we will write these as BCA, representing the direction cosine matrix mapping from the components of a vector R in the A frame to the components of that same vector in the B frame. Again, remember, position vectors are geometric blobs in space having only magnitude and direction. They are completely and utterly frame independent. The components of those vectors are utterly frame dependent, but there exists a linear relationship between the components of the same vector between two different frames. And that relationship is encoded by this matrix multiplication. So you will have previously encountered the, the direction cosine matrices, but perhaps as rotation matrices or rotation operators. Um, so these are in fact the uh, component representations of a rotation dyadic. Uh, and this is something that is incredibly important when you're sending rigid body mechanics. And for us, we're just gonna take the result and use it because it's a very useful result. So other aspects of this result are that direction cosine matrices are elements of what is known as SO3, special orthogonal group in three dimensions. And that means that they are orthogonal matrices, which means that the inverse of BCA, which is the opposite rotation, which in our notation we will call ACB, flipping the order of these superscripts, is the same as the transpose of that matrix. So the inverse operation is the transpose of the matrix. And we can compose direction cosine matrices representing multiple successive rotations just by matrix multiplication. And here's where our notation is helping us out. So if we have a direction cosine matrix mapping from I to a frame F1, and then another one mapping from a frame F1 to F2 and F2 to F3 and so on and so forth up through frame Fn, all of these interior things, just like in the case of vector addition, collapse down and this total product will be I mapping to Fn. So what this means is that if I right multiply this by the representation of a position vector r in the unit in the components of frame fn what will be spat out on the left hand side is a representation of that vector r in components of the i frame so perhaps a more simple example is if we just think about a couple of frames a couple of rotations if i have a c b and then i have b c d multiplied together this will give me the direction cosine matrix a c d allowing me to map between components of a vector in frame B and frame A. And I can do the exact same thing to transform the components of dyadics, but because they're now a higher dimensional quantity, I need to apply this twice. And so the way that I transform a dyadic, this is equivalent to a change of basis of a matrix, if you recall that from linear algebra. So if I have the components of dyadic T with respect to frame A, to get the components of that same dyadic with respect to frame B, I have to left multiply by BCA and right multiply by ACB, which is the inverse or equivalently transpose of BCA. When you are coding things up, when you're putting things into a computer, you should always, always, always prefer transpose operators to inverse operators. Even though on paper, mathematically, for these kinds of matrices, they should be exactly equivalent operations. Once you get into a computer and you're actually representing things with floating point values and using numerical algorithms to do these operations, they lead to different results. And the operations associated with the inverse are much, much more error prone than the simple transpose, which is just flipping the ordering of things. So when you have this relationship, when you know that a matrix has to be orthogonal, you should 100% prefer the transpose to the inverse. And we can define the simplest set of direction cosine matrices associated with rotations about a single unit vector of our reference frame. And thinking about this geometrically, that means that if, we, if all of these are mapping from a frame A to a frame B, then whatever unit vector that you're rotating around stays the same in the two frames. 
So a rotation about A1 will pr produce a frame B whose B1 direction is the same as A1. So A1 and B1 are the same. And then if I'm rotating by an angle theta, A2 rotates into B2, A3 rotates into B3. And again, this theta has to be the same here because this is a right angle. Same thing if I'm rotating about B2. And you will note that these are all counterclockwise rotations. By our convention, counterclockwise rotations are positive. Clockwise rotations are negative. That is always our right-handed convention. So I'm rotating about A2. A2 becomes B2. They are the same. A1 rotates into B1, and A3 rotates into B3. And then finally, if I'm rotating around A3, A3 goes to B3. They're exactly the same. And then A1 goes into B1. A2 goes into B2. And again, this angle is the same. So you will note that qualitatively, the first and third ones visually appear basically the same, and the second one looks a little bit different. And again, that's just the nature of the counterclockwise uh, rotations. We define counterclockwise by looking down the axis, right? So this is counterclockwise looking down. So in your mind's eye, figure out the orientation of this, where the plane is such that you're looking down the axis that you're rotating about. And this qualitative difference is actually borne out in the form of the direction cosine matrices, right? So this is the encoding of the direction cosine matrix mapping the core components of a vector in frame A to the components of that same vector in frame B. And so we will call this the C1 rotation operator. And so this is an operator where you dial in the angle and it has this form. And so you will notice that because the first unit direction does not change, it has this pattern of one and all zeros that the component in the first dimension is preserved by this rotation. The rotation about the second axis will be encoded by the C2 DCM. And you'll notice that the pattern, the negative sign is in a different location here. And then C3, same thing, very, very similar to uh, C1. And the pattern of negative signs is uh, the same as here. And of course, you can take the transpose of any of these and get the opposite, get the ACB matrices. There's a very, very well known and well understood theorem that tells us that any direction cosine matrix, any completely arbitrary direction cosine matrix, can be decomposed into three rotations, up to three rotations about non repeating frame axes. Right? So I can describe any relative orientation of any two reference frames or any two rigid bodies in space via three simple direction cosine matrices rotating, for example, first about the first unit direction, then about the new second unit direction, then about the new third unit direction, right? So that would be a one, two, three rotation, or I can go back and forth and I can do a first rotation and then a second unit rotation and then a first unit rotation. That's a one, two, one set. And there's, as you can see, 12 possible combinations. The only thing that you're not allowed to do is to rotate twice about the same axis in a row because rotating twice about the same axis in a row is not general. It's basically just doing one large rotation about that same axis. And you can convince yourself of that by doing out the matrix multiplication of, for example, C1 with itself using two different angles. And what you will find is that the result is a matrix, a direction cosine matrix that looks exactly like this, except the arguments of all the trigonometric terms are the sums of the two angles representing a total sum rotation. So any relative orientation can be defined as three rotations about non-repeating frame axes, mixing and matching these three basic matrices with different angle values as arguments. A little bit more on direction cosine matrices. They are called direction cosine matrices because every entry of the matrix is represents the dot product between pairs of the unit directions defining the two frames that the matrix is mapping between. So the ith jth element of the direction cosine matrix ACB is equivalent to A hat I dotted into B hat J, which means that the ith j element of BCA, which is the transpose of ACB, is the B hat I element dotted into the A hat J element. You will recall that the dot product gives you the product of the magnitudes of these things because they're both unit vectors. That product of the magnitude is one times the cosine of the angle between them hence direction cosine matrices. So let's use our uh, C3 rotation. And we've now rotated this by 90 degrees so that A1 and A2 are here and A3 is here. That 
how we visualize it doesn't matter. We're pres preserving the uh, right-handed relationship between these two, three vectors. And so we are, again, rotating about the A3 unit direction, which becomes the B3 unit direction, and A1 goes to B1, and A2 goes to B2. And so let's just check that this works. B hat 1 projected into A hat 1 is cosine of theta. The projection of B1 down into A hat 1 is, in fact, cosine theta times the magnitude of A hat 1, which is 1. So this works. B hat 1 dotted into A hat 2. Well, now we have the relationship between this and this a hat two, and this is the complement of the rotation. So this is pi over two minus theta. So this will be the cosine of pi over two minus theta, which if you recall from your trigonometric identities is sine of theta. B hat two dotted into a hat one. Now we have this entire angle, which is theta plus its complement, so 90 degrees plus theta again, right? And so that will, when the smoke clears, give us a negative sine theta. And then B hat two dotted into a hat two, that's just the theta relationship. And so again, gives us cosine theta. B3 dotted into A3, they are parallel to one another. So the angle between them is zero. So cosine zero is one. And then every single other combination, B hat one dotted into A hat three, B hat two dotted into A hat three, all of these pairs are mutually orthogonal. And so therefore they will all be the cosine of pi over two and they will all be zero. So if you stare at this and you go back to the previous slide, you will see that we've exactly recreated the C3 matrix which is great, things work. We can define an infinite number of reference frames, but just like there is particularly useful coordinate systems, there also exists particularly useful reference frames. And so unsurprisingly, we can define uh, reference frames that are analogous to the useful coordinate systems that we've previously mentioned. And these are the polar cylindrical and spherical coordinates. So first let's think about the polar and cylindrical coordinates, right? Before we just had the polar coordinates rho and theta, and those can map algebraically to the Cartesian coordinates in our original reference frame. But what if now we define a new reference frame such that we had a unit vector e hat r that always pointed along this line of rho? This is very useful for tracking things that are moving in a single plane that are best describable by polar coordinates. Now, instead of using polar coordinates, you would just have a single Cartesian coordinate rho along the e hat r direction. And then of course that if, since we've ro rotated E1 into E hat R, that means that we need to rotate E hat two into E hat theta to preserve the mutual orthogonal nature of the reference frame. So this is exactly a C3 rotation. We are rotating E1, E2 about the E3 direction. And so E3 remains the same where E1, whereas E1 and E2 get mapped into E hat R and E hat theta. So we can use our previous results. We know that the uh, direction cosine matrix describing the relationship between our initial I frame and this new polar frame, which we'll call P, is exactly the C3 theta matrix, which we've previously defined. And so that means that if we take the components of our vector pointing from coordinate origin O to a point P, the components in the polar frame have to be equal to PCI times the components in the I frame. And so we will describe the components of this vector in the I frame in Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z. And so if we crunch this out, we will have x, y, z times this matrix. And when the smoke clears, we'll have these combinations. Z, of course, remains the same because we have this pattern of zeros and ones in the third axis. And so that's good because we need that z component to complete our cylindrical coordinate set. But you will see that we have the relationship x cosine theta plus y sine theta has to be equal to rho. And interestingly, we appear to have developed the constraint where negative x sine theta plus y cosine theta has to be zero. And if you crunch this out, if you take the, what you know about trigonometry and trigonometric relationships, you can prove to yourself that this has to hold true for this relationship. And so this works. More interestingly, we can take the inverse operation and recall that all we have to do to take the inverse of PCI is to take its transpose. So ICP is the transpose of PCI. And the only thing that happens is that the negative on the sign term switches places here. And we multiply this by the components of our vector in the polar frame. And we should get back our Cartesian coordinates, which we do. We get exactly the relationships that we previously stated when describing polar coordinates. So there you go. So there, there's a key distinction being made here. Rho and theta are polar coordinates of the I frame. 
Rho, however, is a Cartesian coordinate of the P-frame because it is measuring along the unit axis of the P-frame of E hat R. And so it's serving double duty here, but you just have to keep this clear in your mind what it represents. When you're using these coordinates with the I-frame, they are polar coordinates. When you're using these coordinates rho specifically and z with the P-frame, they are Cartesian coordinates. And we can do the exact same thing for the spherical coordinate system. We can define a unit direction, which we will call r hat, that is always pointing in the direction of this point P. And this is now very useful for tracking something moving in three-dimensional space that is most easily describable by spherical coordinates. So now we are going to build on top of our polar frame. And so we've already taken a theta rotation about the E3 direction. And now what we want is for the third unit direction to point in the direction of P. And so we will take a phi zenith angle rotation down from E hat three, which means that we are rotating about the second unit direction. And so remember now, composition of direction cosine matrices is via matrix multiplication, and it is always a left multiplication for subsequent rotations. So we start with a C3 rotation of theta, and we follow it by a C2 rotation of phi. And when you do the linear algebra and crunch this out, you get this form. And again, we can track back to the Cartesian coordinates. And so x, y, z, the Cartesian coordinates in the I-frame are going to be the direction cosine matrix I, C, S, which is the transpose of S, C, I times the coordinates of this vector in the S-frame. And this has just one, one uh, coordinate to it, R, because we specifically defined this frame such that the vector R, P, R, L, O is describable by the single magnitude R, which is the magnitude of R, P, R, L, O. And when you do the linear algebra, you get exactly the relationship that we've previously discovered for the spherical coordinates. A really key thing to point out here, right? We, we did this uh, matrix multiplication out this way because that's how we visualized it. We visualized going from I to S, and then we needed to take its transpose. And so just remember a key result from linear algebra. The transpose of the matrix product AB is equal to B transpose a transpose. So not only do you have to take the transpose of each matrix, but the order of the multiplication flips when you're taking the transpose of the whole product.